Welcome to the Gospel Addict Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. You are listening to the Gospel Attic Podcast, where we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel, but we also interview people whose lives have been changed by the gospel. On today's episode, it's my privilege to interview Bob Bevington, who went from being an eye doctor to a best-selling Christian author. Uh, one of the best-selling books that he's written is called The Bookends of the Christian Life, which he co-authored with Jerry Bridges. Welcome to the show, Bob. And if you don't mind, take a few moments and just introduce yourself to our audience who might be asking, who is Bob Bevington? <laughs> okay, Greg. Um, number one, Bob Bevington is a, a friend of Greg Bryan. And Greg's had a really wonderful role in my life. He introduced me to one of the most important people I've ever met, and that's Jerry Bridges. Jerry, of course, is co-author of the book that we're going to discuss today and also another book that he and I co-authored called The Great Exchange. But yeah, I'm a friend of Greg Bryan, number one. Number two, I'm a, a person who um, the Lord opened my eyes back when I was 16. And um, it's been uh, quite a journey ever since. Had its ups and downs, some significant downs along the way. And um, it turns out the genesis of this book, The Bookends of the Christian Life, really defines um, the big turnaround in my life. And that is when I learned the real meaning of the gospel. And uh, previously, I thought I knew the gospel. And uh, your listeners probably know that the gospel is not the ABCs of the Christian life. The gospel is the A to Z. You probably, I've listened to your podcast, so I know that um, Tim Keller may have made that popular, but there's many, many people learn the hard way that uh, you don't um, start the Christian life um, with the cross and the resurrection and then spend the rest of your Christian life sanctifying yourself by your white knuckle willpower. And that's something that um, I did, and um, I was actually led to do that. Um, and it, it resulted in a lot of frustration, a lot of heartache, a lot of failure. And, um, and so when I learned that the gospel is the A to Z, the way I learned it was Jerry Bridges taught it to me through the material that became this book. And, uh, but anyway, who am I? A little bit more than that is I am an optometrist. I graduated from the Ohio State College of Optometry, 1980. I practiced full time uh, you know, for 15, 20 years. I started a LASIK company and, uh, in 1998 and sold that in 2001. Then I sold all my practices, which were four in number. And then I had a lot of time on my hands because I got uh, my schedule, which by the way, I still see patients a day and a half a week. I got it down to a day and a half a week in 2001. And that's when I started um, having long, many hours, long, quiet times <laughs> with the Lord uh, until I landed in some other kinds of businesses and startup companies and this and that. But I do consulting. Um, I've had five books that are published, four by conventional publishers, one self-published book called Regarding Jesus. Um, and who am I? I'm just a no good, low down sinner who's saved by grace and covered by the righteousness of Christ. And I couldn't be happier. I, 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 I'm telling you, I'm just the happiest guy, you know, other than yourself, Greg. That's great. Um, talk about how you met Jerry Bridges and the impact that he's had on your life. And maybe, maybe even some people may not even know who Jerry Bridges is. Okay. So uh, the story goes, that the legend goes, that um, Greg and I were friends. We met at a wedding of a, of a mutual friend from the Navigators. 
And uh, we started getting together for lunch and uh, really enjoying one another. This was, what year would that have been, Greg? I knew you were going to ask me that. Early 2000s, I think. About, yeah, 2002, somewhere around there. At any rate, uh, you and I would flip books back and forth to each other. When we read a good book, we'd share it and uh, usually give each other a copy. And I read The Discipline of Grace by Jerry Bridges. And you came over, and I'll never forget, I flipped you that book, and you're like, Jerry Bridges? I know Jerry Bridges. I could bring him to Kent State anytime I want to. I just have to send him a plane ticket. I said, buddy, where do I sign? <laughs> and I sponsored the trip. And so uh, when Jerry came to town, you had a little dinner party over at your house. And uh, that's where I met Jerry Bridges. And by the way, Jerry Bridges, well-known, best-selling, I mean, truly best-selling, not like me when you use that word regarding, regarding myself. But Well, when I say you're a best-selling, when I say you're a best-selling author, I've heard that 90, 95% of all books never sell more than 5,000 copies. And and uh, this book ends of the Christian life is sell well, well beyond that. So... Yeah. I consider you a best-selling author. I mean, it, 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 it has surpassed that criterion. Uh, but anyway, Jerry, okay, so he had The Pursuit of Holiness, has sold to date over 2 million copies. He also wrote uh, Trusting God, Even When Life Hurts, sold over a million copies. And then he has another mere 30 more books or so. <laughs> and... Uh, at any rate, so I, I knew about that. And uh, so I was excited to meet Jerry. So I walked into your house, Greg, with, with this dinner party. And Jerry and I were like two magnets and we started talking. And I literally had to force myself to pull myself away from him because um, other people <laughs> needed to be introduced to him other than me. But then I was fortunate enough, uh, we had planned a bunch of stuff. One was a, a talk at Kent State where it was advertised um, all over campus. There's, I don't know, a couple hundred people at that in the auditorium there in Kent State. Um, then he spoke at the Gospel Co or the um, Chapel Co Coalition of Consortium. Consortium of churches. Or, yeah, like 120 churches. He spoke at that. And then um, he, he spoke did something at, at your house. Yeah, a fireside chat with Jerry Bridges with 50 of my closest friends. <laughs> What a great night that was. Um, and then I got to take him to the airport in the morning. Well, I picked him up at your house. I'm thinking, I've got him in my car for a half an hour you know, with a captive audience with me. And I thought, I can ask him anything I want. So I prayed. I said, Lord, what should I ask Jerry Bridges, you know, since I've got this time? And it came to me to ask him to pray because it was like six o'clock in the morning. I said, Jerry, would you pray just as though you were alone with the Lord in the morning and just pretend like I'm not here, but would you pray aloud? He goes, okay. It was so cool because I saw him and heard him apply exactly what he'd been teaching. He started with his little circle, that where, you know, your family and the people he just left and the people he spoke to the night before. And then it expanded out a circle that included his family and on both coasts or in Colorado and on the East Coast. Then he was praying for our nation. And before I knew it, he was praying for the world. And I'm like, who prays for the world? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and he was, oh, actually, I, I, should, I should back up. Before he prayed anything, he rehearsed the gospel. Hmm. He, he preached the gospel to himself. Very yeah, now quickly. let's let's talk about that, preaching the gospel to yourself, because that is a big um, thing from Jerry Bridges, and that also is a big part of uh, this Gospel Addict podcast, is that we don't move on from the gospel. We need to, as believers, as followers of Christ, no matter how solid you are or how strong you are, you need to preach the gospel to yourself daily. So let's talk about that. What was that like? Well, you know, you, you start off with your sins, you know, and and your current sins since the last time you prayed. Now, Jerry Bridges, you know, sin to him is a little different than like you and me, okay? I mean, uh, his idea of sin is being anxious at the baggage claim that his baggage isn't going to come. To him, that's a horrible sin. Like, I've had him call me from halfway around the world to ask for prayer because he and I later became prayer partners. And, uh, and he was all upset one day. And, and I'm like, Jerry, what's wrong? And he was upset with himself because he he was nervous about his bags not showing up. I mean, to him, that's a, uh, but, you know, 
to him. I mean, it is sin, right? It, whatever is not of faith is sin. So anyway, he would then, uh, he then took it to the cross. He said, Lord, you know, here I've sinned, but I know that you are all sufficient as my sin bearer. You not only bore my sin, you bore my guilt, you bore my shame, you bore the curse of God, the wrath of God for my sin. And um, this is the path of his thinking. And then he emerged from that into what I started out, and that is these concentric circles. Mm. But, um, it was it was very profound to see him applying uh, his own teaching. And I later found out that he divides the world into six days, and he has a little map that he carried around everywhere, and he prays for one sixth of the world each of those on each of those six days of the week. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, that that uh, that was that experience. We got to the airport; his his plane was delayed, so I got another hour and a half with him. I started to lay out, you know, what I saw as, as my my failure to learn how to change. And I told him I wanted to learn how to change. And so um, I kind of left it like that. It turns out that a month later, my wife and I were already planning to attend a marriage getaway at the Glen Erie in, in Colorado Springs. Guess who the speaker was? Jerry, Jerry Bridges. Bridges. <laughs> Two days we got to hear him. Guess what he spoke on? The how to book. change. Oh, the bookends. Bookends of the Christian life, yeah. And so he gave uh, two messages, uh, one on each bookend. And then he and I got together and he said, hey, I'm gonna be back in Ohio the next month. Why don't you and I get together and spend the afternoon together? I'm like, okay. And so I came, Greg, with a legal pad full of questions about how to change. And I sat there and I'd ask him a question about how to change and he'd flip it right back to the gospel. And I'm like, no, no, I get the gospel. I understand the gospel. And, and then he would, I'd ask him the next question and he would answer it really briefly. And then he flipped it right back to the gospel. And I got kind of frustrated because I'm like, why does he keep doing that? You know, I get the gospel. So I got in my car and I'm starting to drive home. And it hit me that he said that, that we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that just, that statement just washed over me. That I'm clothed. When God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ that was lived in the flesh by the Son of God who never sinned. But that's not the whole point. The, the other part of that point is he did it in my place as my substitute. He provided a substitutionary righteousness on behalf of his people. And we stand in that righteousness. We're clothed by it. And um, I started weeping, Greg. I started losing it. I'm driving 60 miles an hour or whatever, and I can't even see because I'm tears are blocking my vision. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, you know, you're going to crash into a brick wall. And then I, I said, I don't even care. I don't care if I crash into a brick wall because I was so blown away by this. And finally, the light came on. And, um, and you were starting to change like from inside out. You, yeah. you learned the truth and the truth was changing you from the inside out. And that's, again, why this is so powerful. I, I think so many Christians, and I think the purpose of this podcast is to reach people who are, like you said at the beginning, frustrated, kind of like they, they want to change, but their 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 whole approach to change is outside in. Yeah. It's, it's 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 like doing more stuff, doing more Christian activities. Yeah, I was a legalistic Christian. I'm I'm like, okay, the Christian life is do this, don't do that. I mean, yeah, you know, I believed in his sacrifice on the cross, but then the rest of it is what do I do? And I just burden and burden and burden myself down with all this. And I burdened other people too, as I tried to lead them. And I didn't understand. Um, and of course, this book, when we get to you know, the actual book, that's what this book is all about. Gospel enemy number one, chapter three is self-righteousness. Um, gospel enemy number three, chapter nine, self-reliance. So this is who I was. I was self-reliant. I was kind of God reliant, but just lip service. Okay. I was really reliant on me and my white knuckle willpower. And guess what? He mercifully did not allow that to work. He mercifully let me fall on my face and in, in, in big ways, you know, that, that happened prior to this episode with Jerry. But um, I was, uh, hey, the, the, the ground was tilled, <laughs> plowed, and ready to receive grace and ready to receive the truth of the gospel. 
as really the, the power that God uses to cause change in our life. That's 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 interesting because do you think that if you would have met Jerry like let's say a couple of years prior, like when you were in that legalistic um, framework and doing well, because I think that a lot of times the danger of legalism is on the one side, you, you know, you you never live up and you feel like a constant failure, but there is a side where you can actually be feel kind of successful at it. Yeah. Do you think there's a time when you would have met Jerry and been like, oh, yeah, he's a nice guy. Good guy. Um, I'll tell you what, I have no doubt about it. You know, I kicked back, was making a lot of money, you know, had all kinds of stuff. And everybody, you know, I go to my office and people are like, oh, you know, and it's like you start believing this, these lies, you know, that you're that you're all that and a bag of chips, you know, and you're not. You're, you're nothing but a desperate. I am nothing but a desperate sinner. And so is everyone connected to Adam. And so we we need a savior and there is only one. And then uh, when so what happened after that, you so you, you were talking about you were in tears and what talk, talk oh, a little bit. So, about yeah, so I, I got a hold of Jerry. I'm like, Jerry, I go, let me tell you what happened after I left. So he starts sending me books. He wanted me to read these books. Guess what? All old dead guy books. Not one author was alive, including himself. He didn't send me one one of his books. He didn't tell me to read any of his books. He wanted me to read John Owen and all these guys, you know. The, and uh, the one book that he really, really wanted me to read, it turns out it was out of print. It's John Owen, um, Sin and Temptation. It actually was two separate books. But uh, guess what he did? He photocopied his copy of the book with his notes in the margin. I still have it. Yeah. Wow. He sent me a photocopy in a loose leaf note binder. And that's where I, you know, that book fortunately was later uh, retranslated by Crossway Publishing, uh, Justin Taylor and Kelly Capick. Uh, it's called um, Sin and Temptation. Or, well, maybe Overcoming Sin and Temptation, I mean. And, uh, but, you know, this is where, you know, the rubber hit the road with me to figure out. And, and, you know, again, it's all in this little book. I mean, this, this little book, the book ends of the Christian life. It's designed to be read in under three hours. I mean, it's only like 100 and, I don't know, 120, 100, 140 some pages, but it's just a tiny little book. <laughs> and we crammed in the whole Christian life and all, all of Owen's writing as best we could into that little, because, you know, people don't read these big, thick old dead guy books too much anymore, you know, even though they're the best ones. So one of the things I hear you saying is that Jerry, um, began to mentor you began to disciple you yeah yes I he, mean, how lucky are you man to have that experience well, i mean i was I friends with them i had many dinners with them and i lo love the guy i mean he's with the lord now but um and uh you know I, but you had a unique experience with him you had a unique connection which is really cool yeah i i think the lord just you know opened that opportunity up and you know, yeah, he, he definitely mentored me um, prior to any of this happening. Let me think. Yeah, so I would travel around with him sometimes. He taught a seminary class called The Transforming Power of the Gospel. It became a book by that same title. And uh, it was a week-long seminary class. And I turned that class into a 100-page content syllabus so nobody would have to take notes. And that that was, by the way, I'd really recommend that book, The Transforming Power of the Gospel by Jerry Bridges. Um, and it was after that, I handed him over this 100 pages and I go, now what should I do? You know, as my mentor, I'm asking him, know, what should I do now? Because it took me about three months of working almost every day to get that thing done. He goes, why don't you rewrite Smeaton? Well, Smeaton was Jerry's favorite book outside the Bible. He had challenged thousands and thousands of people wherever he went all over the world. He would, every time he spoke, he would mention the Apostles' Doctrine of the Atonement by George Smeaton as his favorite book outside the Bible, 19th century Scottish theologian. I got that book. I just devoured it. I wore out highlighters. I highlighted more words than I didn't highlight. Now, that's ridiculous, right? But that's every time I read a sentence that I liked, I highlighted it. So anyway, the first book that he and I wrote together was The Great Exchange, My Sin for His Righteousness, and it's a rewrite of Smeaton. And then that book was published by Crossway in 2007. And then this book, the, the book ends of the Christian life was pro, um, published by Crossway two years later. 
but that that's all the background you know um that led up to us you know deciding you know to take this i mean the first thing he taught me you know that's that's what this book is so you didn't necessarily set out to to write a book it kind of came in the in in sort of this uh relationship you had with jerry bridges it sort of happened as he was kind of mentoring you um i mean was there a point where you said you know what i want to be a writer so i'd always felt like you know i had some writing in me my dad was a bit of a journalism type writer uh, he majored in journalism, you know, my college undergrad in pre-med at Ohio State, you know, I did well in uh, writing and I liked it. In fact, my my freshman uh, composition teacher at Ohio State begged me to get out of pre-med and go into writing, you know, and so I kind of never forgot that, but I didn't I didn't go in that direction. But I, I started to write screenplays in my late 20s and I wrote three screenplays and took screenwriting lessons and had a coach and everything. And I thought screenwriting is where I wanted to go, but man, that's a really hard, that's a hard club to break into. You know, there's maybe 250 people are in that club worldwide at any given time. So at any rate, um, when, um, when he, he was the one who said, why don't you rewrite Smeaton, which I did, I wrote that whole book. And then, Crossway would have published it because <laughs> of my name. You know, they they take a risk on your name. I didn't have any, you know, any, any track record. It's like a chicken and an egg problem with getting books published. And so um, the idea came that Jerry and I would be co-authors. And Jerry's like, well, I didn't write the book. You did. I'm like, yeah, what good does that do if nobody reads it, you know? And so um, he ended up writing the the introduction to The Great Exchange and then Crossway published it. And then once that was done, Crossway didn't, Feel like there was really a lot of risk of he and I being co-authors, so this this book here was the easy slam dunk for them. They they uh, the book ends uh, you know, they didn't scratch their head very long. And then besides, it's a short kind of popular type book. It's not an academic book. The, the Great Exchange covers every verse in the New Testament that deals with the death of Christ, and it's a very academic kind of book, like a theologian book. Whereas this, the bookends of the Christian life is a popular application of the idea of the, the gospel. And did, how it it take, did it take about the same amount of time to write both books or? No, <laughs> no, the great exchange took a year of working. Yeah. Three, four days a week. Uh, the bookends, you know, he wrote half of it. Well, he wrote out of the 10 chapters, he wrote four of the, of the 10 chapters. I wrote six. I was able to write uh, each chapter in about a month. So I got okay. like, but you had a lot of the, but this was a lot of those. That's because a lot of the foundational work of the research and stuff had been already done, right? Because he'd yeah. been teaching it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this. I mean, this. A lot of this came right out of his lectures. You know, the, the, that first uh, weekend at the marriage getaway. I mean, it's it uh, it was really pretty easy, Greg, because you know he'd been teaching it. He'd been teaching it to me. He'd been teaching it all over the world. This, this bookends, you know, uh, lecture series that he had. And uh, yeah, so it, it really kind of flowed. You know, he he wrote the chapter one and two. I wrote, no, he wrote one, two, six, and seven. It's fun to see if anyone who knows him and me can figure out who wrote which one. Because they really, you, I made my voice sound like his, my writing uh -huh. voice. And uh, in fact, everything I've written, I try to sound like him. He he. He writes just as though you're hearing him talk. And I find that's a, that's a good way. That's a good, you know, goal when you're writing is to try to, you know, you know, look, people have a hard enough time reading already, right? If you make it more difficult by sounding like you're writing down to somebody, you know, you want to get on their same level. If you have anybody that wants to be a writer, that's, that's one thing I'd recommend is strive to just be eyeball to eyeball with your audience. You're the same mm -hmm. anyway, right? You get, you know, so that's good. That's good advice. When do you, when you're in the zone, does writing energize you or is it exhaust, exhaust you at times <laughs> or both? Yeah, both? Yeah. You know, nothing energizes me like writing. Uh, it's the most challenging thing I do um, by far. You know, it's, it's hard, 
but also it's because it's so challenging i have to rely on the holy spirit to enable me to do it um and when when i'm aware that the holy spirit's enabled me it's really exhilarating and by the way what i my habit is i would write for you know most of a day the morning would be the best the afternoon i'd get a little exhausted maybe do research in the afternoon but then i wouldn't look at it till the next morning and then the next morning i would look at it sometimes i'm like this is awful. I'm just throwing this in the trash. And other times I'm like, who even wrote this? And, I, and I'm like, I, I know I was enabled because I, I don't even hardly recognize it, you know? And so uh, that's exhilarating. But, you know, most afternoons, I mean, I literally have to lay down, you know, I'm not mentally, I'm not a mental giant or anything. So, you know, I, I don't have that much capacity. So I would spend my capacity. That's why I get up real early. And I still do. I just love that morning time where I'm fresh. And uh, did you ever go through a time of like writing block? Yeah. Where so, like, how long did it last? And what was that like for you? So it was the great exchange, you know, it went right through the New Testament, you know, so I got to the edge of the of Hebrews, the beginning of Hebrews, at the beginning of a summer. And I, you know, Hebrews, honestly, that book is not that easy, right? Because you got to really understand the whole Old Testament. I felt overwhelmed and I had a writer's block. I think you would call it that for a couple of months. And I, you know what I did? I just read the book of Hebrews over and over again. I, I listened to John Piper, you know, he's really famous for his series on Romans. He's got like 230 messages. He preaches every word in Romans. It's called the greatest book ever written. It's, it's probably one of the best things I've ever done uh, is listening to those messages, but people don't realize it. he's got one on Hebrews too. And his Hebrews one has got eh, maybe half as many, mess, maybe like 80 or 90 messages. But I listened to that and then I was scared to death and I didn't think I could do it. And, and um, yeah, I really relied on the enabling power of the spirit and people that have read that book, mostly, most of the time they'll say the, the chapter on Hebrews is the best chapter of that book. And again, it's because God, the spirit enabled it, you know. But yeah, that was a, a memorable writer's block for a couple of, all because of fear. You know, I, was, I just, I knew I couldn't do it. And, uh, and I was afraid to step up. And, and yet when the, when the summer was over and school started, there I was, you know. That's cool. Uh, a couple more questions about writing and then we're going to, then we're going to dive into just this book in particular. But um, do you have any early on or do you, do you have any interesting writing quirk? <laughs> well yeah back you know the, some of the books i've read you know get your lucky socks on stuff like that you know it's like some of, <laughs> some of the you know, some of that stuff early i used to have this uh, outdoor man cave you know that i would write in you know i had like this ritual and all that but you know, it's kind of mickey mouse you know i mean really it's about is the lord going to show up and enable you or not and you can't it's not like rubbing a magic genie i mean Sometimes he doesn't show up and sometimes he does. And it's like, I just have to show up and be there and uh, pray and ask and seek. And, and you know, um, and the outcome is up to him. But no, I mean, for the first, I started writing, it would have been in 2005. So it's been a number of years. But now if I go to sit down to write, um, not really. I, I do need some quiet. I mean, I can't have like music playing and, phone calls and social media. I mean, I can't, all that stuff's got to be shut off, you know, uh, that makes but sense. Other, than that, other than that, not really. <laughs> that makes sense. That's hard to do in this, this day and age. Yeah. Hey, what's one of the most surprising things you've learned in creating your books? Hmm. Surprising. I don't know. I mean, I, you put so much time into it that I don't think there's a whole lot of surprises. Uh, maybe, you know, I'm always surprised when somebody comes up to me and goes, you know, that book, you know, God really used that book in my life. And, you know, whenever you hear all that, you know, maybe if, if you know any writers, you know, most writers are not real encouraged, you know, like, it's not like they're like setting the world on fire. You know, there are some like Jerry, but you know, there, there, there's a handful of those, but I'm always surprised. You know, I, I had one, Joe Coffey and I wrote a book called Red Like Blood. I had a, a man and woman come up to me and they said, God used your book to save our marriage. And I'm like, wow. 
wait, what book are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so stuff like that is probably the only real surprising thing. I mean, it's not surprising to me that it you know, takes a long time and it's work. It's hard, you know, um, and, the, and, you know, the, the, you know, I can't feed my family with royalties from these books. You know, I mean, some authors can, but, you know, I've always had side hustles that, you know, whether it's being an eye doctor or whatever it is that they keep the, the roof over our heads. But so you're not in it for the, you're not in it for the money. Necessarily. Never was. No, never well, was. Um, do you hear from your readers much? Yeah. I mean, it's fun, you know, to, to hear from, I heard one uh, from one this morning. He, he, he wanted uh, to know where he could get some more copies of regarding Jesus, which that's my self-published book. That's you know pretty much sold out. It was, there was only 3000 copies printed and, and they were pretty much gone. I saved a couple cases back for myself, but yeah, I, you know, I heard from him. He's like, Oh, we need it for our, our new men's group. And, and um, yeah, I mean, look, it's just a way to to honor the Lord, you know, it's, it's a way to put the truth out there. There's lots of ways like your podcast, Greg. I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, you put it out there and you don't know what the, you're, you're scattering seed, you know, and you don't know what what's going to come of it. That's true. I, I was looking at some of your reviews um, specifically on the book we're going to talk about in, in detail. And uh, uh, one person said, I've read this small treasure at least three times and used it in one-on-one -on -one discipling twice. And, it, and it's been part of a Bible study uh, using this gem. You can pick it up, turn to almost any page and just have it speak to your heart and mind. I mean, it's there's some really, really awesome reviews out there. It's really cool. So my last question before we actually dive into the content of the book, which I definitely want to get there because that's that's really, you know, the 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 power of the understanding the power of the this illustration of the bookends, which I want you to explain to us before we get into the specifics, um, is what do you, what does literary success look like to you? Hmm. Well, literary success is when the Lord's will is done. You know, I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, it's... <sighs> If, if, for example, the person you just read that review, I mean, if if this man or woman is is um, led closer to to the triune God, led into deeper into truth, you know, applying truth, getting rid of lies, you know, um, then that's to me that's success, right? I mean, you know, I took this book, I turned it into a, a seminar. By the way, I got a. I think it's six hour seminar that I've done around the country on this book. It kind of fizzled out after the book, you know, came out after a few years, but, you know, going around like that, you know, I mean, it's nice, you know, to do it face to face like that. That's probably what this person's talking about, you know, to go through this content face to face. Also Susan Beebe from our church, Christ community chapel, she put a study guide out. She took it on herself and got crossways permission so if you go to amazon.com and type in the bookends of the Christian life workbook, uh, that book's out there. So there's, you know, it's another tool to kind of go a little bit deeper. That's cool. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.